Welcome to N is for Networking, the short, sharp podcast where we explain the jargon, acronyms, and concepts of the networking industry in plain language. I'm your co-host, Ethan Banks, a grumpy old network engineer who's been pushing packets around since the 90s. With me is co-host Holly Metlitsky, a university grad with a master's degree working in the networking industry, but pretty new to the scene. And in this episode of N is for Networking, we discuss the difference between a frame and a packet. So Holly, I want to want to throw this question to you first to see if you have an impression of of this. The how if, if if you based on your training and experience have an opinion here, how would you describe the difference between a frame and a packet? You know, a key thing. If I have an opinion here, um, <laughs> okay. it's, it's an interesting question because you know we mostly deal with packets. So while I've definitely heard the words floating around, um, packets is our go-to. Um, in my instinctive idea of it is really perhaps the difference between what OSI layer you're working in. So yeah. layer two or layer three. But um mm-hmm. outside of that, I'm excited to dive into this topic because it's definitely something I don't know enough about. Well you're exactly on the right track when you talk about OSI layers and layer two and layer three. So a frame would map to layer two and a packet to layer three. So with that as the next point to to give us our clue as the difference between a frame and a packet, do you remember enough about the OSI layers to recall the distinction between L2 and L3? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to L2 and L3, for me, it's really just L2 is usually when I'm doing switching and yeah. L3 is really all IP, IP stuff. So while I might not dive into the exact encapsulation and decapsulation of I don't want to use the word packets now because that might not be the correct term. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, just not the ins and outs of them, but I know when I need to be in which layer. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, uh, the thing to keep in mind here, so, so let's just focus on a packet for a second. So a packet typically to us means an IP packet, uh, IPv4, IPv6. It's uh, it's potentially got a globally significant address. That is, you could have some unique IP or I, a V4, or V6 address that uh, is unique around the world. And we have routing tables for the internet filled with how to get to different net blocks, different IP, V4, and V6 blocks that might contain that address. But uh, the 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 key distinction here between layer two and layer three is while layer three has that packet with that globally significant address, it doesn't give us a means to actually move that packet across the wire. It's kind of like uh, if you were shipping a package to someone and you've got contents to get to someone, what do you do? You're going to put it in a box, right? Well, the box would be the frame in this analogy. And there's nerds out there going, well, that that metaphor breaks down, Banks. Yeah, it does. It does in places. But just just roll with me for a minute here. If we want to get the packet across the wire, the wire doesn't know anything about IP. The wire knows Ethernet. Or way back in the day, it would know maybe ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, or token ring, or uh, FIDI, fiber data distributed interface. A lot of those are antiquated now. They're not They're not things. They're not methods with which we send zeros and ones across a wire. The one we think about the most, especially as uh, enterprise engineers, is Ethernet. That's, uh, that's the way we are encoding data to get it from uh, point A to point B across a segment of wire. So what do you think? Uh, what do you think so far, Holly? I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think maybe let's dive a little bit deeper into what you mean by Ethernet. Okay. Because we're, you know, we're saying, okay, well, layer two, it's Ethernet, but mm-hmm. maybe some folks out there aren't quite sure what that exactly means. Right, right. Um. So Ethernet would be the most common way that we move data around a local area network. That is, let, let's just take your house. If your house is wired up with a cable and you've, you've got a a cable that's got an RJ45 connector on the end of it, let's say. Uh, It's got those eight pins, those eight wires inside. You plug it into the wall. You're probably talking Ethernet. There's a bunch of different ways historically that we could, uh, that of standards that were defined to move the ones and zeros across that wire. Ethernet is the standard that we use most frequently. That is the one that by, by far and away, if we're talking about a, a piece of wire or a piece of fiber optic cabling, 
uh, you're using some flavor of Ethernet to move these zeros and ones across the wire. So the standard says, hey, if you've got signal coming in, you need to represent it somehow. And we use some kind of binary encoding. It's zeros and ones that go across the wire. You know, if we were to use an oscilloscope or some sort of a tool to actually see what's happening on the wire, you, depending on what flavor of Ethernet it is, what kind of Ethernet it is, like gigabit Ethernet or fast Ethernet or 10 gig Ethernet and, and on and on. There's so many different speeds. There's different ways that the signal is encoded as zeros and ones. So we could think of Ethernet as uh, a standard that gives us a way to encode data, including what's inside our packets, and move it from a sender uh, to a receiver across the wire. That's, that's the key. Um, and I think the next thing with Ethernet and where it can get maybe it, even more interesting is that all the different speeds and all the different medium that we can use to uh, to do that encoding. So there's copper wire like we might have in our homes. Data centers, especially the faster they go, can't – we exceed the physics of what copper cabling is capable of doing. And so we move to fiber optics. And so there's a lot of fiber optic requirements for very fast Ethernet. All right, let me stop there, Holly. What what do you think so far? So far, so good. I love the um, box analogy. I think that, well, perhaps maybe some people are going to have a little fit that it breaks down at some points. I think it's a good way of understanding. <laughs> you know, you're trying to get something from A to B, and there's layers. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just put you don't, you can't just put my name on a box and expect it to get to me. So, so, um, so then. Uh, here's another way to think about this to keep those layers separated. We, while in our world of networking, we very frequently talk about Ethernet and IP as if those are the only ways to for IP to 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 encode a packet or for uh, layer two to encode as an Ethernet a frame. Well, an Ethernet frame can have all different kinds of packets inside. Back in the day, before TCP/IP one, before it became the standard way to uh, address a packet. There were other layer three standards like Apple Talk and IPX and oh boy, DeckNet I think was another one, and uh, there, there's there's some other ones along the way too. So I say that to make the point that Ethernet could have transported any of those things inside. If we think of Ethernet as the box, you could put an IP packet inside, you could have put an Apple Talk packet inside, you could put an IPX packet inside. Those all would have been valid. The key was just getting that packet and having some way to encode it across the wire so it could be transmitted from place to place. So going back to our difference then between a frame and a packet, um, as you said, a packet, when we are thinking about it from a layer perspective, we're talking about layer three. We're talking about what's happening at the routing layer. And layer two, right, switching. Uh, we're talking about an Ethernet switch that is actually looking at the frame, the box around the packet. Uh, an Ethernet switch. So there's a, we're going to spend another episode talking about a switch can be a router, but a router can't be a switch, I think was yes. how you asked it. And that's why I wanted to do this episode first, because this all gets into uh, some of that. An Ethernet switch moves data around inside of it based on the MAC address of the Ethernet frame. That's the, the core decision-making process that's going on there. Doesn't care whether there's an IP packet inside of it or not. The Ethernet switch, it doesn't matter. It can have anything in it. Nowadays, the only thing you're almost ever going to see in it is an IP packet, but it could be that there's a lot of other payloads that are inside that Ethernet frame. Uh, okay, so where are you at now, Holly? So I'm thinking about something you said earlier, speaking of the globally significant versus like a locally significant address. Yep. Because now I'm thinking, okay, so we've got a frame. Let's chat about, you know, what is that locally significant address? The locally significant address is going to be in the Ethernet standard, a MAC address. It is going to be a 12-digit hexadecimal number. We, we typically see it represented, at, uh, and there's a few different ways you'll see it represented, but that, that's the, the, the core of it. It's a 12-digit hexadecimal number uh, that means something to the Ethernet it is a part of. That is, if we think of Ethernet as a network of Ethernet devices, 
uh, it is its unique identifier on that local area network. I'm me. This is my 12-digit address. Holly's got her 12-digit hexadecimal address. We share the same Ethernet, and we can't have the same Ethernet address. That would be confusion. Uh, There'd be a duplicate address. That would be all kinds of problems. So every Ethernet um, address is, is unique. And interestingly, even though Ethernet is a locally significant address and not globally significant, in theory, everyone that manufactures an Ethernet address has manufactured a globally unique address. Uh, there should be, yeah. in theory, no duplicate Ethernet addresses the world over. I guess that's what led me to my thought process because I'm thinking, okay, I know a locally significant address is referring to a MAC address, but I also know the odds of me and you having the same MAC address should be zero. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my mind, I'm like, but that's technically globally significant, but... I guess in terms of networking, you're not using it to transfer the network globally. It's really located to your LAN. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's right. It's theoretically globally significant, but there's no such thing as a global Ethernet. Yeah. There's there's a whole bunch of different small Ethernets that are interconnected by the internet of a variety of transports. Uh, Ethernet being one, uh, optical transports being another big one. Uh, that would interconnect all of the world's Ethernets together. But yeah, uh, you can take your laptop and plug into any other Ethernet in the world and be safe. No, you're not going to find a duplicate there. And this is because Ethernet device manufacturers have been assigned blocks of MAC addresses. The first, uh, the first six digits of the MAC address are unique to a manufacturer. And and there's some other, we can get into some special classes of MAC addresses and so on for things like multicast addresses and so on that are beyond the scope of our call of the day. But, uh, right, uh, you and I can pick up and move our devices anywhere. A manufacturer can sell a device to anywhere and not have to worry about a duplicate uh, address. But again, since there's no such thing as a global address, a global Ethernet, I mean, there is no uh, um, global uh, Ethernet that we're going to be switching the world over. That's 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 not a thing. Yeah. And, and I guess we could get into why that is at some point, but uh, but it has to do with scale. Uh, Ethernet mm-hmm. doesn't uh, doesn't work like that. <laughs> Although, interestingly, Holly, part of what you uh, are a specialist with in your job is EVPN VXLAN. Now that. Yeah takes MAC addresses and use and moves them around over layer three. So we've kind of got some disruption of the layers here. So maybe that's a, that's a conversation for another day, I suppose. Yeah. It's, you know, we start here and suddenly you start working backwards and it's things get very complicated very quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, this is a good place for us to start our series is, uh, is this conversation because things like e- EVPN VXLAN make a lot more sense when you understand these differences and the differences between routing and switching on, on more detail than the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, Ethernet is interesting in that it has grown far beyond in use what was ever conceived by its creators. It was conceived as a small, convenient way on a single wire to tap everybody in and be able to communicate and share data. And it's grown into this monster where you can have tens of thousands of devices more that are participating in the same Ethernet. And to make that work, uh, switching became a thing and... uh, and then later, uh, the VXLAN uh, became a thing so that we could move layer two frames ar- across the top of a layer three infrastructure where you're taking a layer two uh, frame and wrapping a VXLAN wrapper around it. A tunnel. Yeah. And so I, I know that's yet another question that you've got is yeah. like tunnels versus tunnelists and talking about that. Well, all right, Holly, I think uh, any any final questions before we wrap it up for today? I don't think so. I think this really covered the differences and, you know, gives you a good understanding of also maybe touching the OSI layers and how that Mm. all comes into play. Because I think I actually had somebody ask me the other day, you know, talking about this podcast and what they wanted to hear. And like, can you just please tell me why we even need the OSI layers? And I thought, oh, (laughs) well... Yeah. That, that's definitely something to chat about if if you're not sure where they play into. Uh, so this is just a key example of yeah. exactly where they fit in. 
So well, the, the funny really thing about well. the OSI model in 2024 is it's antiquated. It really is. It mm-hmm. works for certain things and begins to fall apart at other layers. Uh, so layer one, two, and three works pretty good. Layer four, yeah. Start to get into five, six, and seven. Yeah, not so much. It doesn't make sense. And uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm actually not a huge fan of the OSI model yeah. in 2024. But because it is taught everywhere and it is the thing, the part of the vocabulary of a network engineer to say things like L2 and L3, you kind of, we still got to work in that framework on some level. But but there's better ways to think about it. So maybe that's another show, yet another show, Holly, as we talk about the OSI model layer and some other ways that we could layer the uh, the network stack and, and how to think about it. There are some mm. other models there that are interesting. Oh, and then your question about MPLS, you know where MPLS fits in the OSI stack? It doesn't. No. It's kind of layer yeah. two and a half. <laughs> it kind of fits in between yeah. layer two and layer three. <laughs> so it's hard to win. All right, Holly, if people want to follow you on the internet, where do they do that? LinkedIn. You can catch me under Holly Metlitsky. I'm there. Excellent. I'm Ethan Banks. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, Holly and I are also on the Packet Pushers Community Slack group. There's an NS for Networking channel in there if you'd like to chat with us or make suggestions or give us some feedback on what you're hearing here today. And uh, thanks for listening to this episode of N is for Networking. Uh, This is episode one. If you have topics you want us to cover, you can go to packetpushers.net slash follow up and send us your message. What would you like Holly and I to talk about next? And we'll add you to the list. And just remember that networking isn't hard. Other people figured it out, so you can too. 